is Simul Cap YouTube for DVR purposes. All right. <laughs> yep. Okay, that was my bad. You know, because I, I, I deleted some of the announcements from the previous semester, but I did not delete all of them because I thought, hey, I can reuse some of these, and then I forgot that the link you know, of the invitation was also in one of those announcements. So when people read only some of the announcements, um, they would be they, they might end up using the wrong uh, invite. All right, so I'm gonna check. Well, I guess I'll check you know, in just a little bit just to make sure that uh, people are joining the right server. I am not sure. Um, according to the icon, I am. I, you guys should be able to hear me. All right, so I'm going through the member list. We got Kevin, and let's see, and Victor. Okay, there we go. All right. So we got a few more people joining us. <clears throat> yeah, if you mute me from past classes, um, that uh, mute status would actually be sticking with me. So, um, all right. Uh, we got about 20 seconds to go, and I am going to check the member member list one last time you know right at about uh, 430 and then we'll start the class all right so I'm going to the surface settings and check one more time just to make sure I catch everybody all right no one joined recently very good so I think this is it uh, no you guys don't have to turn on your camera if you want to that's fine you know I don't mind uh, but there's no it's not necessary you know because I, I'll be just keeping my eye on the text channel uh, for questions you can also use a voice to ask questions uh, you can also take a screenshot, you know, um, copy and paste the screenshot into the text channel to ask questions. This is why I really like Discord, or I prefer Discord to Zoom, because Zoom doesn't make it easy to screenshot and share a screenshot with a group. Um, you can also not use the text channel if you do not feel like sharing your question with the rest of the class, or you, if you don't want the rest of the class know that you ask a particular question, you can also DM direct message me with that question. Um, and I promise I will not name people when I get direct message you know, questions. So that can be another way to ask questions. All right, so it's uh, 4.31. I'm going to check one more time, just one last time before we start the class, just so that I don't miss anyone. Uh, server settings, members, and we got one more person, cool. Okay, so we got Sarah, who's joining us now, very good. <clears throat> and I'm gonna start the class. All right, well, welcome to my CISP 440 class, I'm TAC. Uh, in case you have not watched the syllabus video, um, if you have not, um, please watch that video as soon as possible because I think it is important. Um, that being said, I'm going to spend just a little bit of time to kind of share with you guys um, something that, I, that I'm doing new for this semester. So this is new for this semester. This is called a mind map. The program is called Free Plane, and it is free as in free beer uh, because it's an open source program. I've been using it to document um, how to achieve academic success 
in not just my classes, in basically all classes. Um, I've already talked about it a little bit. Um, so what I do want to point to would be you know this section here, the process. Before a lecture, it is important, or I think it is going to be helpful to prep for the lecture. So it's not just me, you know, studying, you know, reading a little bit ahead of myself, you know, what I'm supposed to teach, but you can read ahead of me and the rest of the class too, just so that you have some idea of what we are going to talk about and take notes at the same time. Okay, you know, take notes whenever it is possible. Um, number two, attend the lecture. This is a synchronous class, which means, you know, you guys get to ask questions interactively in the class. Um, and that makes it a little bit different compared to other asynchronous online classes, you know, where you don't really get a chance to ask questions interactively. So I'm keeping an eye on Oh, how do you do a screenshot? Yeah, it depends on the operating system. If you just kind of Google screenshot and then your uh, the operating system that you're using, you'll probably find the first or the second link you know, to provide enough information for you to uh, do a screenshot on you know in your particular operating system. Um, all right, so moving on. Right here, uh, we don't have a lab for this class. You know, this is a lecture only class, so we don't have a lab. Uh, but after a lecture, it is also important to review and reflect. Okay, so this means basically going through the material, making sure that you understand all the concepts. And this is also why it is important to take notes, because if you take notes, you can review your own notes, and then you can read your own notes and go like, okay, am I really understanding all of these concepts? So that's going to be important. Um, I'm just catching up on the text channel. All right. Cool. All right. <clears throat> um, more on this one. Uh, for homework assignments, we don't really have a whole lot of homework assignments. I can give you guys some more, you know, ungraded assignments, you know, just so that you guys have a chance to practice stuff that we talk about in class. Um, so that is certainly something that I can do. Um, and then there are resources that you can find on campus. Um, there are two classes specifically, HCD 310 and HCD 382, that can teach you know, uh, note taking techniques, you know, how to take a class, you know, how to get a, you know, prepare for a class and stuff like that. You guys are already in CISP 440, so I'm not going to suspect that, you know, you're going to really, really need that, but um, it may not be a waste of your time either, you know, if you just kind of go, you know, take one of those, you know, classes and kind of check out whether people have some ideas that you may not have known already. Uh, for people who have issues, you know, reading, um, math and computer science and engineering and science, you know, stuff, RAD can be helpful. So this is a link. Um, I can, I think I already shared the actual document with you guys already. Um, so that is a resource as well. You know, I think RAD is free. I'm not sure about HCD um, 310 and th uh, 382, whether you can take those classes for free or not. All right, so Sarah cannot hear me. I'm not sure why. Okay, let me just type to confirm that. All right. Okay, so I got some people who just joined us. <laughs> this does happen every semester. Some people kind of push it a little bit too close to the deadline. And we're going to add those people in. Yeah, just one more. There we go. I'm just, uh, let me reply to that person. And get back to our text channel here. All right, so Sarah, can you hear me now? Oh, OK, great, excellent. All right, cool. Um, so I'm going to go back to this, you know, from time to time, um, just so that, you know, I can share with you what, uh, you know, what I know about taking classes. Um, and you have to keep in mind that I did not do 
exactly the same thing when I was a college student, but um, I think it's a good idea to be exposed to these concepts, you know, of how what you can do to help yourselves, you know, to succeed in the class. Now, in this class, I do have to emphasize that critical thinking is a big deal. In other words, uh, you can look up critical thinking and find out, you know, what how it is defined, and you can also find out, you know, how you can learn to think in a critical way. To some people, it comes naturally; just that's just the way they are. And to some people, because of exposure or the lack thereof, it may not be natural. It may not be the first you know, thing that they do. So I think it's it's important to understand whether you are already thinking in a critical way or not. And if you think that you may not, you know, then you know, we can look up some resources so you can learn how to think in a critical way. I asked a friend about this, and my friend who's working for the Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and he's a he's a super smart guy, and he said, you know, critical thinking is something that people are born with. I kind of disagree. Um, I think it is not exactly something that people are born with. Some people may be born with more tendency to think in a critical way, but I think this is something that everybody can learn. So, um, so we'll talk more about this as necessary throughout the semester. Um, I also want to kind of focus on structure just a little bit. This class is synchronous because I need the structure. Okay, I don't know about you guys, but I need the structure. So I need to be here on Mondays and Wednesdays at 4:30. Because otherwise, I have I'll get distracted by all the other things that I need to do. So maybe you know structure is helpful to you too. Maybe not. Okay, but I know it is important to me to have structure. So for structure, you know, one really important part of having a structure is a schedule. So because we have a synchronous lecture, that is already. Part of the schedule. So if you schedule your pre-studying, the homework, and then the uh, the reviewing of the material before and after the lecture, then you already have a schedule for all of these you know, important steps of taking a class. Um, it's also important to break up tasks uh, for people with ADHD or just ADD. It is important to break up tasks so that each uh, subtask is small enough that you can finish it in say you know, 10 to 15 minutes. Then you can take a short break and then go back and continue with the next task. Uh, collaboration is also helpful, but it kind of depends on who you're collaborating with. Some people are more uh, of a have a they, they have a distracting nature and some people have a um, you know they will help you focus and help you stay structured. So you know kind of choose your collaborators um, carefully. That's all I'm going to say. Um, for the subjects on the tentative dates, yeah, the, so the tentative dates are really kind of loose. Um, I wouldn't pay too much attention to that. <laughs> the ordering in Canvas is important. Let me uh, get, uh, get rid of the uh, mind map. So if you go onto Canvas, you know, you guys can see something that is a little bit different. I'm going to turn on student view just for the time being. So what you're seeing here is the order where I will go through the topics. In other words, what we'll do today is Boolean operators. Okay, and then after Boolean operators, we'll talk about basic set theory. And then after that, we'll ba talk about basic quantifiers. And then we're going to go back to set theory using quantifiers. And then we'll talk about functions and so on. So this order is, for the most part, the the way I am going to introduce the topics. So I think it's important to understand that this is already, you know, a uh, sequence that I have used for many semesters, and um, it seems to work. You know, the topics seem to be introduced in the right order. All right. So do we have any questions? I'm not seeing any questions. So once again, if you have any questions, you know, you can either type your question in the text channel of today's date. You can uh, you know, just kind of voice your question using the audio. You know, just turn on your mic and start to ask questions. Not a problem. 
or if you prefer you can also use a direct message and just let me know what question you have so all of those channels will work in this class all right so, hi professor tech can you hear me yes i can yes uh, i sent you an email a couple of days ago about, about the uh prereq um just one one quick uh one quick time um if you added a point to the prereq does yes. that mean that you have it's met. approved yes okay cool yeah, thank if you I, if i add a point that means you have met that specific uh requirement so there are two okay uh one requirement is a prerequisite and it's math 370 which is the old class and then uh 372 which is the new class so if you took cis um it's, excuse me if you took math 370 it's not going to show up on my prerequisite checklist um, simply because 370 doesn't exist anymore. So the system cannot find that, that you, you have taken CI, uh, math 370. So in that case, and you have not taken math 401, 400, or 402, which many of you have already taken. So if you have taken uh, math classes post uh, 370, I would have marked uh, this particular requirement checked already. But if you have only taken 370, but not the 400 series yet, then you will probably have to file a prerequisite challenge to explain that you have taken math 370 and it should meet the requirement of math 372 because uh, 372 is basically the quote unquote modernized version of 370 uh, due to a, um, a state law change. So that one should be easy. I think most people have met the math requirement. CISP 430 is a tougher one because there's no way I can actually check whether people have, uh, whether people are taking CISP 430 in the same semester or not. So if you are taking CISP 430 in this semester in order to meet the co-requisite uh, requirement, then you need to, um, you know, just print your, uh, enrollment record, you know, to a PDF, and then you know, post the PDF as "quote unquote" part of the assignment, um, and you know, that's all you need to do for CISP 430 as a co-requisite. If you're transferring from a different college, then you will have to file um, uh, pre and po uh, pre and co-requisite cha uh, challenges, uh, and those forms you can get from the BCS division office. And in those cases, you will need to post your form before you send it off to the division office so that I know it is in progress. All right. Any questions? Did I answer the question? OK, I'm going to assume yeah. that I. Yes. Oh, OK, excellent. Thank you. All right, so I already sent you guys a video on the syllabus, so I'm not going to talk about the syllabus you know, today. Um, if you have not watched that video, you know, go ahead and watch it. You know, I made it so that you will watch it. So I'm assuming that you guys will watch that video so that I don't have to waste too much time to talk about syllabus and other things that are not actual topics of this class. Um, there's one more thing that does not seem to have anything to do with the class content, but I think it is still important. Um, it's the MTBI personality test. Uh, MBTI stands for Meyer Briggs, Myers Briggs Type Indicator. It's a personality assessment type of thing. Um, it really helps people to find out where their aptitudes are, you know, what they are really good at. Um, and I think it is important to match um, the aptitude of people to their um, area of study. So that might come back in later on in the semester, uh, typically after exam one, but I'll talk about it when we need to talk about it. But right now, if you're curious about your personality, uh, this is a pretty good one. It's, be it's better than the Harry Potter one, you know, where, you know, the, the hat will tell you which, uh, which school, which hall you're supposed to go to, I think. Um, you know, that one is kind of fuzzy. This one is has, has more details. All right. So I got a few people typing. <clears throat> well, that's not what I said. <laughs> I simply said, you know, I might go back to talk about the personality test after exam one. But you, you're, you're inferring that that's what I meant. <laughs> 
and that's okay. All right, so we'll begin with something that you guys are familiar already. Okay, so we will we'll start with Boolean operators. So let me go ahead and start this in a new tab. Okay. Yeah, it's okay for you guys to have issues with your mic, you know, unless you want to ask questions interactively. Um, if you have a problem with your mic and you cannot speak, you cannot ask your questions with your voice, you can always type it. You can always type it in the text channel. If anything, I prefer, you know, the questions to be typed because this way, you know, you can the, the questions can queue up and I can answer the, the questions in sequence. But if everybody starts to ask questions using their voice, you know, I can't really, you know, you know, answer those questions in, you know, in a, in a sequence like that. Um, yeah, a screenshot will work as long as it shows your uh, student ID and also the class that you're enrolled in. That should work. So that should answer Jonathan's question. All right. So now we are talking about uh, Boolean operators. Oh, one more thing. Um, for those of you who have been looking for a tool to take notes, okay, um, you know, paper works, okay, you know, it's great. Um, but what paper cannot do easily is to capture URLs, links to certain things and whatnot. So um, if you are looking into an electronic note taking tool and you don't want to pay for stuff, um, there's one that I found and I, I think it's an alternative, you know, possibly something that's useful to some of you. It's called joplinapp.org. Oh, okay, so Wilson said uh, Notion and RemNote are also good options. Okay, I'll take note and find uh, find out more about those. Uh, so Joplin is interesting because it uses Markdown as the language to take notes. So Mark, Markdown is uh, something that's very easy to type using just a plain text editor. Um, it doesn't really use HTML tags, you do, although you can, you can use HTML tags if you want to, but it's pretty easy to type and the best part is it can handle math equations using LaTeX notation. Um, yep, Adam is correct, Markdown. Um, Joplin has its quote unquote own, you know, Markdown variant. Um, it can handle math equations, you know, using the LaTeX notation. So it's, I think it, that's a potentially a great tool for taking notes. Uh, it does take a little bit of time to kind of get used to Markdown, so you know, you might need to look up you know how to do things for the first two weeks or so. But you know after for the first two weeks, as long as you use the tool, you know um, a lot of times, um, I think you will be proficient um, because it really is a fairly easy to learn type of notation. And as I said, you know you can. Uh, use a plain text editor to change uh, the content. So anyway, that's just something I want to point out. Um, you can also create references within a document. So if you want to define a term and then later on have other sections to refer back to the definition, it's fairly easy to do with Markdown as well. All right, so what we'll do is we are going to start with the content. So we will start with Boolean operators, and we'll start with Boolean operators that you already know, which are, the first one is conjunction. Conjunction is a fancy word for the English word and, and I'm going to change the notation how I represent a uh, truth table. So this particular truth table, you know, for this column, it means you know this column means you know, when x equals to false, then this column means when x equals to true. This row is equal is saying that y is false, and this row is saying y is true. So each cell at an intersection between a row and a column is giving you the result of conjunction when x is false and y is false for this particular cell. So that's not conventionally how we use a how we represent a truth table, but it is kind of some way for people to look at. Um, if you think about multiplication table, this is what it looks like. Okay, it's kind of like a multiplication table. So for those of you who look at this and go like, "This is awfully confusing and it doesn't look like a truth table," we'll go ahead and take a look at an actual truth table in this case. So let me go and start up. 
mouse pad. It's just you know kind of notepad on my in my system. I'm using Debian Linux, so um, the tools are equivalent, but they are named in kind of funny ways. All right, so we got X, we got Y, and then we are looking at X and Y. So when X is false, Y is false, X and Y is false. When X is false, Y is true. The conjunction is also false. When X is true, Y is false. The conjunction is false. The only time when the conjunction is true when is when X and Y are both true. So this is a much more conventional type of truth table where we have the independent variable listed as the first bunch of columns and then the expression that we want to document as one of the other uh, columns. Are we doing okay so far with this discussion with the conventional truth table? Are there any questions? Okay, all right, excellent. Cool. All right. All right, so now that we have talked about, so conjunction, okay, there we go. So the symbol for conjunction uh, is discussed down here. In CISP 360 and all of the other programming classes, we use ampersand ampersand to represent logical and. In As a math symbol, it looks like an inverted upside down V. Um, but in this class, I'm going to use the shorthand of multiplication. So it looks like multiplication, but it actually means conjunction. If you have any doubt of, you know, in the context, whether I mean multiplication or whether I mean conjunction, go ahead and ask. Most of the time, the, the, the context of the discussion will make it fairly clear whether it is just arithmetic multiplication or whether it is logical um, and. So that's it. That's section 3.1. You know, conjunction, ampersand, ampersand, something that you have learned already like a few semesters ago. Uh, disjunction is the fancy word for logical or. So if you don't like this truth table, we'll go ahead and look at logical or using a conventional truth table. So let me control A, control C, and then paste it. So logical or is bar bar in C and C++. So there we go. This is the truth table of or. The only time you get a result of or is when x and y are both zeros. But if at least one of those two is a true, then the disjunction or the or is going to be true. All right, so I got one private message coming in. <laughs> yep, someone is late. Um, I'm going to let that person in. Yep. Pretty sure I said quite. Oh, okay. Actually, we got two people or two accounts of the same person. There we go. All right, being punctual is important in any class. So let's try to be uh, punctual. All right, so getting back to the notes here. So this is how you see logical or in C, C++ and a whole lot of programming languages because a lot of programming languages such as Java, JavaScript, they're all derived from C and C++. In, in as a mathematical symbol, it looks like a V, but it's not really the V symbol. It just looks like a V symbol. Um, but in this class, I sometimes would use arithmetic addition. You, I would borrow the notation of arithmet arithmetic addition to mean logical or. Okay, so if you think the context does not tell you whether some whether the plus is arithmetic addition or logical or you can go ahead and ask to clarify. All right, so let's move on to negation. So this is the <laughs> table of negation. It's pretty easy. Um, basically, it is just um, the a fancy word of not. <clears throat> 
sort of okay so let me go uh, go to Amon's um, uh, comment it's not exactly the same um, because 1 plus 1 in binary is actually 0 and not 1 so it's not exactly that um, but it does match the uh, abstract algebra so I'm not sure how many of you need to take abstract algebra but in abstract algebra you know what they use multiplication as a symbol does not actually mean you know arithmetic multiplication and addition doesn't mean actually you know arithmetic addition they're just borrowing the symbols to mean some abstract operator um, we are not into abstract algebra in this class we are into boolean algebra in this class so we'll get to the point where we have to kind of talk about um, those particular concepts all right, so make another truth table here for negation. So since negation only needs one operand, so we only have one column for the independent variable, and then the other column is for the expression. So x as an independent Boolean variable can either be false or true, and then the negation of that is uh, when x is false, negation of x is true. When x is true, the negation of x is going to be false. All right. So let me check out the time. It's about time to take row. So you guys will be asking, but how are you going to take row? This is an online class. Well, it's actually pretty easy. Let me get out of student view first. And you might want to sign into Canvas right about now, okay? Because, well, I mean, you got about 10 minutes to do it, but I, I would much rather just get it done and not have to worry about it. So um, you cannot see this yet because I haven't released it. It's called row taking 2021-0823. So what this is, is it is in the form of a quiz with a single question. I will show you that. And the question is, what were the tech used for row taking purposes? And I'm going to show you the answer. So it's super duper easy. The answer is, huh, it did not take my, oh, I didn't save it. That's okay. It's either class or this. Okay. So you can use either word. I'm going to type it in the text channel. So I'm going to say this and also class. So you can copy and paste either one as the answer. So now I go back to details and save and publish. You got up, you have up to 510 to enter your answer. So once again, the correct answer is in the text channel of Discord. Copy and paste it. Lowercase this versus lowercase the class. You can choose either one. They are both correct. So go ahead and, you know, do the little row taking activity. You know, you, you can also consider this as a as a very short break, okay, from the heavy duty discussion of Boolean operators that you already know. All right. So, do we have any questions about taking row? Are you guys doing okay with uh, the the quote unquote quiz? It's not actually a quiz, it's just, you know, a way for me to make sure that you guys are here. <laughs> just the word, just one of the two words. You can use this, you can use class. It's just that single word. It's actually exclusive or because you don't want to put both as the answer. Just take pick one. <laughs> yes. But don't put this exclusive or class. You know, that would not be considered as a right answer. Just choose one of those words and copy and paste it. All right. So I'm going to guess that most people are done with row taking. So this is how we this is how I would do it, you know, taking row in a class, you know, that is taught online in in a in synchronous mode. Um all right. So now we're gonna move on to section four that talks about 
quote unquote other operators. So there's an operator called NAND, N-A-N-D, which stands for negated AND. So negated AND is can be expanded using this little equation here. So this is another tip, okay? If you want to learn how to use um, LaTeX to enter mathematical equations, because you whatever engine you use, this is actually in Canvas too. I mean, if you're taking a class in Canvas, you know, from the math department, and your professor wants you to use math math equations, you can actually use this notation in Canvas to enter your equations. So to learn how to do this, especially the little up arrow thing, the what kind of uh, symbol we use, how do we enter that? Right click on the math equation, and then go to show math as. Okay, um, I need to move it a little bit here and then go to tech tex or what looks like tex is actually tau epsilon chi command and it will show you you know what symbol you need in order to enter this in LaTeX format okay so up arrow backslash up arrow you know actually will render as an actual up arrow uh, the little negation symbol you know which looks like a cliff is backslash neg neg for negation and then the wedge is the conjunction symbol. So the, so just one more thing, okay? Just one more thing you can use you know, to learn uh, one more thing that might be useful not only in this class, but also in your other classes. Oh yeah, we, we, we covered negation. I took notes, right? There we go. So I, I really highly encourage all of you to take notes too. <laughs> because that particular question seems to suggest that some people are not taking notes, which I think is really, really important. I mean, we are going over some really casual topics right now. I mean, you know, these are the things that you already know. But down the line, at some point, not very far from, not very distant from now, we're going to talk about something that's a lot more involved. And at that point, taking notes is going to be important. Okay, because you need to kind of dissect every concept and make sure that you make connections between the concepts. Okay, so we'll get to that. All right, so what about NAND? Why? What? It, it's a very, it's a very weird little operator. So if I need to define it in, as a truth table, it's not difficult. Okay, so we have two independent variables. X can be false. X can be true. And when x is false, y can be false or true. When x is true, y can be false or true. So that's pretty easy. So now we want to look at NAND. Okay. Well, NAND really is just the negation of AND. So we are really just looking at the negation of x and y. So you look at this and go like, ah, we can just cheat a little bit. I wouldn't call it cheat. Okay. I would just call it we can reference something that we have already talked about, which is up here. So we just have to negate every single one of those. So we have true, 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 and false. Okay? But you can also just say, hmm, instead of representing it this way, which is kind of cumbersome, we'll just say this is x, nand, y. There we go. That's how nand is defined. But you might look at this and go like, why do we want to deal with NAND? I mean, that looks pretty useless to me. Well, as it turns out, if you have NAND, you don't need the other ones. If you got NAND, you can use NAND to define negation. You can use NAND to define uh, just regular conjunction. And you can also use NAND to define disjunction. So let me explain these few uh, rows here. So the first one says, you know, the negation of x is the same thing as x nand x. Okay. Now, to some people that might make sense, and to um, some other people that may not make sense. So if it doesn't make sense to you, what are you going to do? I'm actually asking the question. If something oh, yeah. I talk about in class doesn't seem to make sense, what are you going to do? Make a truth table. Excellent. That is a great idea. Okay. Now, the truth table concept is something that can that you can only use when you have a finite domain and a finite codomain. We'll get to functions, you know, so that those terms would be more relevant. But for the most part, okay, if you can easily 
enumerate all the possible values for the variables, then you can use a table to look at how a particular operator, quote unquote function, behaves. So let me show you what I mean by that. So what we are going to do is to look at x nand x. So we only have x as an independent variable, so you know, we only got two rows in this case. So now we're looking at x, the negation of x and x, which is x nand x, right? So if you finish the evaluation of this, you go like, hmm, x is false, x and x is going to be false, not false is going to be true, and you will figure out that this one is uh, is false. So when you look at this this column, when you look at this column and you compare it with this column, you go like, hey, they look exactly the same. So this is all you need to do in, uh, in Boolean um, calculus or Boolean algebra to establish the equivalency between two expressions. If you can spell out every single way to have the, the, the values in the independent variables, and for every single way you can arrange the values in the independent variables, the expression gives you exactly the same results, then the two expressions are equivalent. So in this case, not x is equivalent to, guess what, x and x. All right. So what about the next one? Same thing, I am not going to do this one, but I will encourage you to do it as an ungraded assignment. So I want you to use a truth table to establish the equivalency between x and y, and this long expression here, which is x nand y nand x nand y. Okay, I know it is tedious, but I want you to do it as an ungraded assignment so that you, one, so that you understand what a truth table is, and two, you actually will go through the process, okay, to understand what is NAND and how to establish equivalency between two expressions. All right, so we got a few messages from the text channel. Yes, so the answer is yes, NAND can emulate all Boolean operators. It is the only operator that you need. But the same thing with is can be said with nor. So negated or negated and they both have the power to um, emulate all of the other um, Boolean operators that we have learned. So that is really cool, right? <clears throat> now for those of you who have taken CISP 310 from me, this is a review. Well, or I should say this is this should be a review because you know that's a concept that I talked about quite a bit at the beginning of CISP 310. How long will the lecture run until? Let me show you how you're going to find that out. So what you do is you look for American River College class schedule. So you will find that I do this a lot, which annoys some people to no end, but that's not going to stop me from doing it, which is me not actually answering the question directly, but showing you how you can find the answer. So you look up CISP 440. Now, if you're annoyed by this, I'm actually, you know, it's not my intention to annoy people, but I want to do this. So you look up this, you look this up, and you can even look at the details. And this is where you can find the co-requisite, prerequisite, you know, um, CID, which is you know, which template class it fulfills or require, which template class requirement it fulfills. And it will also tell you um, the schedule. Let me look up the schedule. Where is it? Section information. There we go. So the class is supposed to end at 5.30 p.m. And we meet on Mondays and Wednesdays. All righty. So I can see a few classmates are supplying the answers too. All right, that is cool. Uh, this is a practice exam. Too early for that. And it's not for this class either, so we are good there. All right. <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, so the there's a question of will you post this ungraded truth table assignment on Canvas? 
if you remind me next class, okay, if you remind me on Wednesday, I'll be more than happy to work it out during class time. So that way, I'm not just giving you the answer, I'm also um, going through the process to show you how I would get to the answer. All right, and there's another comment here that says, like a lawyer telling you how to defend yourself rather than doing it. No, it's more like a fisherman telling you how to make a fishing rod and how to make your own fishing line and how to fish instead of giving you a fish. Yeah, it's kind of more like that. Uh, this video is not posted on Canvas. <laughs> At the, so if you go to the, um, uh, how do you call that thing, uh, pinned thing, so if you look up uh, in the interface of Discord, you will find a little thumbtack thingy at the top. Click on that one, and you will find a link to the recording of today's lecture over there. So that's how you find the recording of each particular day. You just go to the text channel of the date of the lecture, and go to all the pinned messages. Typically, there might be one or two, maybe at the most three pinned messages. The first one is going to be a link to the recording on YouTube. So there is that. But I prefer people to be participating through um, Discord because YouTube has a horrendous lag time, somewhere around 10 to 15 seconds. So by the time people can think of questions, I'm already I have already moved on. People can't really ask questions that way. Whereas you know Discord has a very short lag time. You know so you know when I ask questions, you know when I ask whether people have questions or not, you guys actually have the time to think about it and respond to it. Yes, absolutely. You can watch post semesters, and you might learn something useful in the post, uh, you know, sem past semesters, not post, past semesters. Yep, yep. And YouTube has not complained to me yet. I think I got uh, like two thousand something, you know, recordings, and each one is um, the length of a full lecture, which is one hour and what twenty minutes. So yeah, 80 minutes each one, and then have maybe 2,300, 2,400 at this point. Yeah, YouTube doesn't care. I mean, Mastor is basically free, you know, for people like uh, like Google. All right, so we're gonna move on to some um, operators that are kind of difficult to understand from a surface pers perspective. Okay, so the first one we're gonna go over is called implication. Okay, so implication has a symbol that looks like this. It is a double arrow from left to right. In some other literature, it is a single um, right arrow. Either way is okay. Okay, there are several forms to represent uh, implication, but I choose this one because a single right arrow has a different meaning in this class when we get to functions. So we're going to stick with a double um, right arrow as the symbol of implication. So if you don't want to read this particular truth table, that's okay. I'm going to give you the easier representation. Let me get back to the text uh, editor right here. And I'm going to be lazy and do a little bit of copy and pasting. So we do have x and y as independent variables. But implication is really defined as not x or y. So we are really doing the same thing as not x or y. And for those people who do not remember the um, priority of operators, uh, we apply the negation first, and then we apply the disjunction like this. So now let's go ahead and figure out the values for each row. So we're going to get rid of each one, and we'll figure it out. All right, so for the first one, what is the value of the expression not x or y? It's going to be true because x is false here, so not x is going to be true, and this is disjunction, which means if at least one side is true, the whole thing is going to be true. The next row is going to be the same thing because we still have not x, and x has a value of false. What about this row over here? Not x or y, x is true, y is false. All right, very good. This is uh, false. What about the last row? The last row is pretty easy because y is one of the components of the disjunction and y is true. So the whole thing is going to be true over here. And that's it, okay? 
This is implication. Implication is not x implies y is exactly the same thing as not x or y. Okay? That's how it's defined. Okay? Look at it as mechanically how it is defined. So now the question is why do we define something like this? It, it looks kind of odd. It is not exactly or, okay, because we have to negate x before we perform the or. So why do we need something like that? Well, that's because when you are proving something in mathematics, in any branch of mathematics, in any type of logic, when you have tried to prove something, you are trying to establish a long chain where each link is an implication. So you have A implies B, B implies C, C implies D, D implies E, and so on. So that links you know, everything from the very beginning, which are typically axioms, all the way to the statement that you want to prove to be true. That is why implication is so important in a class like this, because this is how we prove theorems. So there will be a lot more stuff about proving theorems later on. So right now, we just want to understand what is implication. And this is the definition of implication. So I'm going to digress a little bit here. You will find that I digress fairly often in my classes, because whenever, whenever I think of something as being potentially useful, I will digress a little bit to talk about it. All right, so I am going to go to map one. Nope. Oh, this is not what I want. Um, test link, new concept. There we go. So one thing you can do is every time we talk about a concept, you want to kind of put it into a note uh, somewhere. Okay, you can use um, free plane, you know, okay, let me show you, you know, the actual title screen so you can see the entire thing. There we go. You can use free plane, which is a mind mapping kind of tool. You can use uh, Joplin. You can use any note taking tool. You can do it on a piece of paper. But the idea is you want to write down what is the name of the concept. You want to write down the definition. You want to write down what you need to understand first before you can understand this concept. So let me give you an example. Okay, so we can control C and let me start a new map here. So I'm I'm really kind of showing you, you know, one thing you can do to kind of take notes for this class. So in terms of you know the, the root node, I'm just gonna put in today's date, CISP for 40, and if you don't need the full thing, because you know, it's gonna be in 2021 anyway, so we can just need to remember it's uh, August 23rd. And the concept that we are talking about here is implication. So the definition of implication, now you can add a child node by clicking the insert key. So in, and then now you can go ahead and type, you know, whatever the, defini the definition is. So you can say X implies Y is defined to be not X or Y. Okay, that's the definition. What is the prerequisite? In other words, what do you need to understand first before you can understand what an implication is? Okay, so that's going to be uh, just the usual Boolean operators. Uh, we just need to understand negation, and we need to understand or. Okay, or you know, if you prefer, you can write down disjunction. I mean, use fancy words. Okay. What does it relate to? What what does it do? Okay, well at this point we don't really have any examples. Uh, why is it important? Okay, I just mentioned why it is important. This is used to prove theorems. There we go. And this is in return asking, you know, what do we use implication to define? What thing is dependent on? The definition of implication. Well, we haven't really talked about it yet. Okay, so we will leave it blank. So as we talk about things, as you review the material, or as you preview the material, you can start to populate certain aspects of the terms or the concepts that we talk about in class. Okay, so now I can switch back to the notes. Oh, okay. 
Jonathan is typing something. We got two Jonathans. We got Jonathan Wong and Jonathan Camarena. All right, so Jonathan says it is not the case that a blue cat is sick. Yep, exactly. Um, okay, so, okay, let's get back to what Jonathan said in the text channel. And I'm going to bring it up to here. Okay, I'm going to talk about and explain what, what is implication. So what we'll do is somebody pays me to say, Tech, can you give me a pearl of, a pearl of wisdom? Can you tell me some a statement that is profound? And I said, a blue cat is sick implies tomorrow is doomsday. Yes, I know you guys are going to go like, what? What? And let's just say the guy paid 50 bucks for my pearl of wisdom. So now the question is, um, is this statement true or not? How do we know whether this statement is true or not? In other words, when do you think this guy, this person who paid me 50 bucks, can get the 50 bucks back because this statement is not true? That is kind of the question, okay? So we'll go ahead and think about the four different scenarios. So the first scenario is to basically confirm that the blue cat is in fact sick and tomorrow is in fact doomsday. Okay, or you can go back and say, you know, today is doomsday and then yesterday a blue cat is sick. So either way, okay, that's just a relative, it's just relative in terms of time. But if that scenario happens, is this statement true? Think about it a little bit. So think about the scenario of today being doomsday and yesterday a blue cat is in fact sick. The question is, can this person get the $50 back? Not that the $50 is going to do much, do much good you know, on doomsday, but the question is, can that person get $50, get, get the $50 back? The answer is no, that person cannot get the money back because the statement is fairly clear that, you know, a blue cat is sick it implies tomorrow is doomsday, which means if a blue cat is sick, then tomorrow is going to be doomsday. This is really just confirming that the statement is in fact true. So no money back because of this scenario. Next scenario. The next scenario is uh, today is not doomsday, and guess what? Yesterday, I could not find a blue cat that is sick. Now, we're going to talk about quantifiers at some point, um, because <laughs> it is not the case that a blue cat is sick is by itself a little bit tricky to understand. Because what happens when there are actually no blue cats? Well, if there are actually no blue cats, then a blue cat being sick is not true, okay? So what about this scenario? Today is not doomsday and yesterday I, I cannot find a single blue cat that is sick. Can that person get the $50 back? The answer is no, you cannot get the $50 back because this statement is still true. It is still not proven wrong, so it is still true. All right, so what about the next scenario? The next scenario is um, today is actually doomsday, and then I could not find a blue cat that is, that is sick yesterday. Can I get the $50 back? Can that person who bought this statement get the $50 back? Sort of. So Wilson is correct. Okay, It is sort of true that the default is quote unquote true unless you prove it wrong. But it's not really quite that, okay? Because implication basically means the first thing is sufficient for the second thing. It doesn't say it is necessary, it says it is sufficient. Okay? So getting back to the example, in this case there's no refund of the fifty dollars either. So even though today is in fact doomsday and yesterday I could not find a blue cat that is sick, I can, you know, the refund is not going to happen because what the original statement is saying is the first thing, which is a blue cat being sick, is a sufficient condition 
for tomorrow being doomsday. Okay, so it doesn't mean that there cannot be other things that can cause today to be doomsday. It simply means that a blue cat being sick is by itself a sufficient condition for today to be doomsday. But it does not say that a blue cat being sick is the only reason why today is doomsday. Okay, so that is the trick. Okay, so the last one is the only case where a refund is has to be issued is today is not doomsday and then yesterday I indeed found a blue cat that is sick. So that is the only time when the person can get a refund because when if this when this particular scenario happens it contradicts that the blue cat being sick is a sufficient condition for tomorrow to be doomsday because tomorrow did not end up a doomsday. So that is the implication. Well, okay, no pun intended. This is this is what implication is for. Okay, it is for logical arguments, but it is really important, you know, to understand that if you say x implies y, if x is false, then the implication is by default true, because all that because it doesn't say anything about what happens when the when the um, when the condition on the left hand side is false. An implication doesn't say anything about those situations. It only says one thing, which is if the left hand side, if x is true, then it is a sufficient condition for y to be true. That is all that it is saying. So I see a few text. Can I show it as a table? Hmm, I think this goes back to note taking because. If anyone has been taking notes, I already showed it. All righty. Can I match the statement to the table? Pretty easy. So x is equivalent to a blue cat is sick. And then y is um, tomorrow tomorrow is doomsday there we go mm -hmm. yep absolutely now one more thing about taking classes from me is because you already know that I am recording the lecture it doesn't mean that you don't take notes okay just because I am recording the lectures I am not recording your thoughts. You can you can go to YouTube and watch rewatch the video. All you're going to re-experience is what you're watching right now on your screen. So your own thoughts is not going to be captured by my video. I am not a mind reader. I cannot say, hmm. I can definitely tell that Peter is thinking about this right now. Let me let me just voice it out so it will be recorded. It doesn't happen. Okay, I'm not a I'm not a mind reader. So what you need to do is to use note taking to write down what you are thinking at the moment. Okay, what you are, what concepts are being related as we talk about these you know, topics. At a minimum, okay, when we talk about something that is like implication, okay, it's kind of confusing, it's kind of hard to understand. Um, write down something along this line. Okay, you can say tech talks about implication at 5.31 p.m. on August 23rd. That's going to be super helpful. Now, why is it going to ha be helpful? Because we know that whatever you see in the live, um, the screen sharing in Discord is being recorded, right? And you can see there's a, you know, timestamp all the way up there. So if you record the correct time and the date, you know, you can, that can serve as an index to go back to the lecture recording and you can locate and pinpoint the discussion of a specific topic without having to watch all the way from the beginning or having to scan because you know exactly when I start to talk about it. Now, by the way, this time is incorrect because I have been talking about implication for a while. This is just an example of what you can do. So when I'm about, when I'm starting to talk about something, 
jot it down, okay, in your notes. And you can probably say, but Ted, you can do it for us too. The answer is no, I am not going to do that for you. <laughs> because if I do everything for you, you're not going to you know, do something. Un unless you are actively doing something to capture the content and the concepts and stuff like that, it's not going to sink in. All right, so we got some text activity going on. All right. So the last one is equivalency. Okay, equivalency is defined as it can be defined in, in by implication. So we can see that x is equivalent to y is defined as x implies y and y implies x. Okay. What is the truth table going to look like? So let's go ahead and take a look. All right, so we'll go ahead and make this one a little bit longer, okay, because I want to spell out exactly how to do this. False, false, true, true. And then we get false, true, false, true. Okay, now we have x implies y. And then we'll track y implies x separately. And then we'll finally track what is x implies y and y implies x. Okay. So I'm going to do this for, you know, in, in class. Okay. So because you know, it's pretty easy to do. So we have true, true, false, true. This is copied from here because, you know, not x or y is x implies y. This is the other way around. Okay, so x, y implies x is going to be true. Y implies x is going to be false. This is going to be true. And this is going to be true. If you are not convinced of any specific value here, then you need to expand into this format to evaluate the expression yourself. Um, was the notation made to resemble the mechanical definition of equivalence? Yes. All right, so now we look at the conjunction between this value and this value, because, you know, that after all, we are doing the conjunction between x implies y and y implies x. So in this case, the first row ends up with a 1, Second row ends up with a zero. Third row ends up with a zero. And the last row ends up with a one again. So this row here, this last row, the, the row all the way to the right hand side, is the value of x is equivalent to y. Also known as x if and only if y, or iff, -F, if and only if. So let me just jot it down here, okay? So because this is something that you want to add to your notes, okay? Because you want to capture that in a format that you can use, that you can remember, that you can index, that you can utilize in an exam, okay? You know, the way I document things makes sense to me, but they may not make sense to you. So you have to make sure that you know, whatever way you take notes is the way that makes sense to you. And that's why I cannot take notes for you because, you know, my brain is not necessarily wired the same way as yours. So anyway, um, x implies y. So I'm going to be a little bit lazy and just copy and paste. OK. Is also known as, OK, also known as, aka, OK. Um, this is the symbol. You know, I'm just approximating a double bar, you know, with arrows on both ends. But it is also saying x if and only if y, which is iff. You know, when you see iff, it means if and only if. So if you are not really sure that you can remember that, write down, write it down. Okay, so if and only if means if and only if. There we go. So if and only if is important because in this case, um, it means you know two expressions are exactly the same thing. You know, if one is true, the other one has to be true. If one is false, the other one also has to be false, and it goes in both directions. 
All right, so we got some questions coming in through the text channel. I'm going to take a short break from introducing any new concepts, but I'm going to answer some questions that you guys might have at this point. So if you have any questions, now is a good time to kind of think about it, type it out, so I can answer those questions. All right, so the question is, Looks like nor NAND results. Exclusive nor exclusive AND. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not uh, familiar with those terms. Exclusive nor. Or negated exclusive or, I suppose. It it, it does. It is ex it's negated exclusive or. That is correct. So it's more like NXOR, not XNOR. Just to clarify, x if and only if y means that x is true only if y is true and vice versa. Okay, let me let me digest that statement a little bit. x is true only if y is true and vice versa. Yes. So, uh Khadija is correct. That's one way to look at if and only if. Okay, we got two more, three more people typing. That's good. I really like you guys when you're typing questions because that means you're actually trying to absorb the material. You're actively listening and watching the video. What is the meaning of downward arrow and diagonal arrow? They don't have any specific meaning. They are really just you know indicating how to read the rows and the columns. So y with the down arrow means you know these two are representing values of y, and then the right arrow means you know these two are representing values of x, and then the diagonal thing means you know these cells are representing x if and only if y. That's all. And that's why this format is a little bit confusing, and I am going to give you the less confusing format, which is the more traditional truth table format here. All right, so next question. When is x is false, y is false being true for the output useful? Um, not by itself, okay? So I think what Adam is saying is, why is this useful? Well, this by itself is not useful. But what it is useful for is it defines if and only if being, you know, if one if x is false, y also has to be false. When y is false, x also has to be false. It is these are defining this the, the vocabulary that we'll be using in this semester quite a bit. Okay, so when I explain other concepts, I'll be using these concepts. So that's why, you know, these are the building blocks of the statements that we'll be, we'll be talking about in different topics for this class. And we're just building up the, the vocabulary. It's kind of like asking, why is the word the useful? Well, by itself, it's not really that useful, but it becomes a really important part of a sentence when we form larger constructs in sentences. So that's kind of the deal of what we are talking about here. Uh, next question. Um, did we cover the equivalences to implication in terms of the Morgan's Law? No, we did not. So we did not talk about the Morgan's Law at all in this context. It's not yet time to talk about the Morgan's Law. It's really cool, but we are not, you know, we, we are not there yet. Uh, next question. So we use equivalence to prove theorems. Mm, not so much. Okay, so you can, okay, you can use equivalency to prove theorems because, you know, it, because within, in, uh, within an equivalency is hidden um, two implications. So if x implies y, excuse me, if if, the, if a statement says x if and only if y, it does hide um, the implications within, okay? But most of the time, you know, um, it doesn't go both ways. When you look at the proof, you know, it only goes in one direction. Now, many steps will go both ways. If you look at algebra, it goes both ways. Let me illustrate what I mean by that. 
Okay, so let's let's just think about regular algebra. So regular algebra says if I say x equals to two two y plus three and then the whole thing divided by oh let's make it even more complicated. Let's let's complicate this side here. So let's say we have x divided by twenty-three. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> so let's say we're looking at this. Uh, equality. Okay, this single equal here is equality. So now we say, hmm, we can now use if and only if, right? So we can say if I multiply both sides by 23, then the equality st should still be held. So we can say x equals to 23 times 2y plus 3. So this goes in both directions. In other words, if I give you this equality first, you can derive this equality. But if I give you this equality first, you can also derive this equality. And that's why it's a double-sided arrow, because one implies the other. Now, if you tell me that this equality is not true, then I can tell you that this equality has cannot be true either. So that is one use of um, equivalency, you know, if and only if. And in this specific case, it is both, it, it is bi-directional. You can start on one side and reach the other side and vice versa. But in a general proof, it is ne not necessarily bi-directional all the way. It's usually bi-directional when you're dealing with alge algebraic you know, uh, manipulation, but there are a lot of reasoning that do not use just algebra manipulation, and some of those are only going in one direction. In other words, they only go in the implication you know, direction, and go only goes in one single direction. Um, D Morgan's law. What is D Morgan's law? That is interesting. Okay, so since you guys are asking, or at least one of you are asking, and we have time, we'll go ahead and introduce uh, D Morgan's law, and then when it's time to um, talk about it in more details, we'll do that too. So D Morgan's law has two parts. Okay, so we we'll talk about D Morgan's law. There are two. Okay. Yeah, the, not the. <clears throat> oh. <laughs> it's probably the last name of someone. Someone who discovered, you know, this particular equivalency. Okay, so we'll go ahead and talk about this. Okay, so we'll have not x or y. So that turns out to be exactly the same thing as not x and not y. And it goes in both directions. So if you want to use equivalency right now, you can. So if and only if. There we go. And the second one, because I rem remember I used the rule of law, right? De Morgan's laws, right? So the other one is the negation of x logical and y is true if and only if not x or not y. All right, so these two are De Morgan's laws. Um, they look kind of awkward. It's like, okay, so it looks like we're distributing the negation from outside in, but in doing so, we have to change an or to an and. And if we start with an and, we have to change it to an or. So that's De Morgan's law. And you look at De Morgan, De Morgan's law and go like, Tech, can you prove this? Can we prove De Morgan's law? My answer is, yes, we can, but I'm going to make it a ungraded assignment too. <laughs> so, ungraded assignment. Prove De Morgan's laws. All right, so without giving you the actual proof, which I will do on Wednesday, if you remember to uh, to remind me, what is the approach? What is the general approach to do this? Something that we have looked at quite a few times already. So what kind of mechanism do you think we can use to establish the equivalency of these statements? Exactly, truth tables again. So what we do is we do something like this, and then we evaluate this expression as one column and then we evaluate the other expression as another column. 
If those two columns have identical values for each row, then the two the, the expression um, ex the expressions corresponding to each column would be equivalent because when one is true, the other one is true. When one is false, the other one is false, which exactly is the definition of equivalency. Okay, reminds me of the bubble trick for logic gates in logic design. Yeah, sort of, sort of. Um, yeah, De Morgan's law is actually going to be very important later on in this semester because we're going to use De Morgan's law to um, transform Boolean expressions. So there will be one point in this class where we say, you can give me any fancy Boolean expression, but I can convert every single Boolean expression into a very strange, awkward format that is very easy for computers to process. But it, to us, it's like, why are we doing this? We, there's, there are better ways to express this. But the computer says, no, no, I like that format because that's way easier for me to process than the original format. So we'll, we'll, do, we'll deal with that when we get to propositional logic. Um, OK, so reminds me, apply negation to individual components and switch the and and the or and vice versa. That's exactly what De Morgan's law is about. Yep, but it will, be, it will come in handy later on. But right now, we don't need to quite get, you know, the application of De Morgan's law. Right now, the focus is if I just give you, you know, this thing and you know, text says, you know, this expression is equivalent to this expression here. How do you prove it? Right? What is the mechanism? How do you make use? Because you guys already know that we're going to use truth table. The question is, how do you use truth table to prove it? So this is also part of your ungraded assignment. Just do it on your own. Okay, you know. Go through the exercise. It's not going to take you much time. At the most, it's going to take you, what, 10 minutes to do it. But in the process of doing it, you will get a better understanding of Boolean algebra. You'll get a better understand, a better appreciation of you know, the application of truth table and so on. And I think that is really important that you get some hands on to do this. All right, so we got, I've been coding what's on the left-hand side the whole time. So I'm going to say that this is what most, uh, what uh, Jonathan has been using, but you could use this as an equivalent expression. So one more question, because we are, oh, we are running out of time. Okay, fine, I'll be kind and, you know, on time, because I said being punctual is important. So I'll be punctual and end the class on time which doesn't happen very often. I usually overrun by five, 10 minutes. Um, anyway, uh, we're at the end of this lecture, which means we are also at the end of this module. What do you do before Wednesday? The ungraded assignment, try to get it done. And also, you know, you, I would recommend that you pre-read, okay? You preview uh, basic set theory before class on Wednesday. And that's it. Now, um, I have my office hour, you know, right after class, which means I'm going to stay on Discord, even though I will st basically stop the screen share. I'll stay on Discord to answer any questions that you guys might have. Um, I mean, you know, I'm going to take 10 minutes or so to, to eat something and drink something. But I'll be back to answer questions. Um, let me see. There are a few more questions here. I mean, if you guys need to go, go ahead. I'm just looking through the text channel to make sure that I address every single one of those questions before I leave. Um, is the pre-reading in the modules? Uh, we are just reading whatever is next. We are done with Boolean operators, and the next topic is basic set theory. That's all what pre-reading is about. Look at this, you know, in execution of a, you know, if you have taken CISP 310 or you understand what is prefetch, you know, in um, instruction execution in a processor, this is what we're doing. We're prefetching the next, <laughs> what, whatever, whatever we need in the next cycle. So that way, you know, we have the pipeline filled up and things can be done with, um, with more efficiency. Um, is the pre-reading in the modules just the 
website links. Yes, that is correct. So every single link, and if you see a little link symbol here, it links to a, uh, what I call a module. I used the term module way before Canvas, okay? So what I call a module is approximately the content of maybe one or two classes, but it belongs together, and I call that a module. So a module that I quote here has nothing to do with Canvas module. Canvas, you know, borrowed that term, you know, from me, unfortunately. Yep, there we go. Yep, you too. Have a great day. But I'll stay online, you know, just in case anyone has any questions. That is correct, Wade. Uh, we want to utilize the mechanism of truth table to prove De Morgan's law, um, just because it's a very convenient and handy mechanism that is really useful in this class. So that is correct. That's the un that's part of the ungraded assignment. All right. Um, I guess I will go off and get something to eat and drink and then I'll be back and see if there are any questions in the text channel but I think I it is safe to disconnect the voice channel right now and stop the streaming to YouTube. Have a nice evening and I'll see you guys on Wednesday.